Okay, so I'll be presenting on the enzymatic and photocase strategies for the selective delivery and release of potaflu toxin. And if you hear any background noise, I apologize because that's my dog. <laughs> so um, as you probably all may know, cancer is one of the leading causes of death um, globally. That's a good fact. And to counter this, a lot of traditional chemotherapeutic agents have been introduced and used in the medical field. Um, however, there are a lot of drawbacks um, of traditional chemotherapies, and most of these stem from the fact that these drugs are not tumor-specific, meaning that, yes, they do kill a lot of cancer cells, but they also kill healthy tissues along with it. So this, of course, leads to a lot of adverse side effects, um, most common being neurotoxicity, bone marrow suppression, bowel issues, um, hair loss, and a weakened immune system. And there are also um, possible long-term side effects as well as delayed effects. So um, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter books, you've probably heard of the Scream and Drake. And these are the magical plants that are known to kill humans by screeching. And that's pretty terrifying, but these plants are also known to be key ingredients in the books for a restorative potion. So although this plant is completely fictional, um, the real life wild mandrake is actually pretty similar to the screen mandrake um, in that the wild mandrake is actually used in a lot of um, medicines, ranging from Native American folk remedies to modern topical ointments um, as medicine. So um, with the ability to harness a plant's toxin um, appropriately, you can actually use it to human benefits, even though these plants don't actually make chemicals with um, saving humans in mind. So, okay, skip this slide. Here's potophyllotoxin, and it's a natural product um, derived from the plant potophyllum, and it's our beautiful compound that we focus on. Um, potophyllotoxin basically works to kill cells by inhibiting microtubule polymerization, which is a crucial step in cell division, so it can halt um, further proliferation of cells. And here you can see the docking of potophyllotoxin binding to the tubulin um, active site. And however, as good as that sounds, it can do all this. Um, it, lacks toxic, um, it lacks specificity and is highly toxic um, when exposed to cells. So we've had, uh, there are a lot of derivatives of protophyllotoxin that in literature are proposed to kill cells, but none of them are actually up for clinical trials, or at least not a lot, since um, you lack that specific targeting of cancer cells. So to mitigate these challenges, we've introduced a lot of methods um, to try and increase the control of release and specificity of the drug. So one way to improve the specificity is with the use of prodrugs. And prodrugs are basically made to be biologically inactive until it is exposed to a certain condition, which can be a pH, an enzyme, or light. And our specific efforts to project potophyllotoxin center around a 2 nitrobenzyl functionality, which as you can see here, um, is this portion of the compound shown. And uh, the 2-nitrobenzyl photocage in simplest terms is basically a protecting group that is photolabile. So when um, exposed to a certain wavelength of UV light, it will detach from the potophyllotoxin. So taking a step back, atopicide and tenepicide are existing um, cancer drugs in the clinic that are derived from potophyllotoxin. And these drugs act on the cell by um, inhibiting topo isomerase, which is different than the way in which regular potophyllotoxin works to kill cells. Um, and you can see that these two have modifications on the C4 um, hydroxyl. So the C4 hydroxyl is actually seen as a key um, portion of the chemical that regulates the biological mechanism of potophyllotoxin. So that's part of the reason why much of our work is centered around um, changing, um, modifying the C4 to see what effects it has on the characteristics and toxicity of PODO. So this is more of a detail on how projects work in general. As you can see here, the inactive drug has the R group attached to it, and with the right conditions, 
um, the R group is released to make the active drug. So this allows for more targeted drug release and a reduced toxicity. Since in comparison, traditional chemotherapeutic drugs, um, which lack any specificity, and this caused a lot of severe side effects as the ones that I mentioned, um, projects offer a more selective approach to delivering drugs. And so lower doses can actually be administered um, to the biological system to achieve the same magnitude of therapeutic effects. So here's a more detailed look into how the photoreleasable project works, um, the 2-nitrobenzyl photocade in general. So on the left, you see the 2-nitrobenzyl protecting group, um, which is what I said uh, we use as um, to project the potiflotoxin. And this basically undergoes a NORSH type 2 mechanism when exposed to UV radiation, allowing for the cleavage of poto and the protecting group and the release of the active drug with the hydroxyl over here. We synthesize three variations of nitrobenzyl prodrugs, only differing in the substitution pattern of the aryl ring, as you can see here, highlighted in red for the three compounds. And these three compounds differ chemically due to the um, aromatic substituents of the O-nitrobenzyl group. So you have compound 3A, 3B, and 3C. And we also show this uh, the synthetic pathway of a photocage project down here. You can see that we have um, the starting material and the chloroformate down here. Um, yeah, so contrary to compounds 3 and 3B, compound 3C actually does not photorelease under any of the wavelengths that were tested for. And this is because it lacks the 2-nitro functionality, and this also serves as a control. So in practice, um, we envision that the compounds 3A and 3B, which can actually go to release, can be administered to cells or a biological system, be hit by a certain wavelength of UV light, and induce cells upon photocleavage. Here are the more specific synthetic pathways of our two compounds, 3A and 3B. Um, these two differ in the starting materials. For 3A, we have 2 nitrobenzyl alcohol as starting material, and for 3B, we have 4,5-dimethoxy, 2 nitrobenzyl alcohol. So once the chloroformates are made, they're attached to potiflotoxin over here to make the final compounds. So in more detail, the potiflotoxin prodrugs are inactive before it's irradiated by a certain wavelength of UV light, and it causes the undergoing of the Norwich type 2 mechanism, as seen a couple slides ago, and it produces a detached protecting group over here, and the potiflotoxin, which now has the hydroxyl at C4, which is essential to the biological mechanism of action, so it can basically go out and kill cells now. Uh, compounds 3A and 3B are released, however, at differing wavelengths, and this is in part due to the fact that um, they have different substituents on the ring, and our UV-Vis spectra showed that the addition of the 4 and 5 methoxy substituents actually caused a redshift in the lambda max. So you can see the comparison um, in the spectra for 2-nitro and dimethoxy. So more specifically, compound 3A, uh, the dimethoxy is released under UVA, which is 380 nanometers. Compound 3V releases under UVA and UVC, 380 nanometers and 3, sorry, 28, um, 280 nanometers. And both 3A and 3B do not release under 420 nanometers. And as mentioned, uh, compound 3C does not photo release under any of the given wavelengths. So to carry out the actual testing of these compounds to see and confirm whether or not this photocleavage actually happened, we um, assay them via LCMS to monitor photorelease kinetics as well as quantize um, the photorelease. So mass ion quantization basically allows us to see how much potiflotoxin is present in the solution at a certain time point, uh, which basically translates to seeing how much of the potiflotoxin project has photoreleased. We started out by determining the retention um, time for just regular potiflotoxin. So this serves as the basis for what we can look for in the LCMS taken of the actual project's exposed UV light. 
Uh, here are the LCMS for compounds 3A and 3B before they were exposed to any UV radiation. And you can see that there's no distinguishable peak where the photophototoxin was um, on the last slide. So that basically signifies that there is no photo release happening before it was exposed to UV radiation, which is good since we do not want any photophototoxin just like floating around in the compound before we actually expose it to the appropriate wavelength of light. Um, that changes, of course, after exposing the compounds to UV light. Um, so this is the LCMS of the 2 nitrobenzyl prodrug after seven minutes of radiation. And you can clearly see the peak of potoflotoxin here. And uh, throughout comparing multiple time points um, or multiple LCMSs of the time points that were taken, you can see that the potoflotoxin peak grows. And that basically signifies that over time, the longer you expose it to light, uh, the greater the extent um, to which the project photo releases is. We also have HPLC data to track the photo release and validify our LCMS data. And these are assays that were initially carried out during a 10 hour um, long duration um, of UV radiation. And this specific HPLC is for a compound 3B. And you can see that in the comparison of before and after, so T0 and T10, um, there is photocleavage. Whereas for compound 3C, um, this was also radiated for the same amount of time. Uh, there was no photo release. Um, the peaks are the same and basically confirms our initial hypothesis of 3C not photo releasing. Uh, going back to the LCMS assays that we have done, we graphed the changes in concentration, potophilotoxin, the solutions um, over time. And this is quite interesting. Um, you can see that around seven minutes, the photo release actually starts to stall um, over here. And this is actually because of a chromogenic byproduct that is formed uh, and it basically absorbs the UV light and prevents further photo release. Um, this does technically present as potential issue if you're trying to get continuous photo release. Um, but according to the experience we have run um, previously, the photo release does seem to resume after a certain time. So the color change of the solution can also be seen in real life um, when the solution starts turning this hot yellow color due to the formation of that chromogenic byproduct. Um, this only happens when the solutions that are, are being tested for is concentrated enough, but you can see that around um, seven minutes for the 2-nitro and five minutes for the 4-5-dimethoxy, the color starts getting very dark and the photo release um, stalls. Okay, so we also tested the photo release effects over time with the UV-Vis with T0 as our initial output. And you can see that over time, um, the absorbance changes. This one is for compound 3A and compound 3B. And next, we want to see um, whether or not uh, the, pro the projects would be more effective at inhibiting cell growth um, compared to podophilotoxin. And to do this, we used MDT assays and molecular docking. Uh, interestingly enough, potophilotoxin's treatment is more potent um, in the cells, uh, in the cell viability assays uh, compared to our 2 nitrobenzyl projects. Um, however, the docking actually showed that the projects have a higher binding affinity to tubulin, which kind of contrasts the um, results of the bioassays, but we are looking into investigating that in the future. Uh, furthermore, the concentration of the prodrug seems to have minimal effect on the cell viability, um, except for the zero millimolar concentration, of course. And these are things we are also seeking to investigate further into the future. And um, the same minimal effect of concentration is seen in the compound 3A as well. So next, we wanted to see um, whether or not um, we could control the rate of release through the synthesis of potophilotoxin esters. So additional methyl groups on the ester at the C4 position are hypothesized 
to affect the interaction between the esterase assay and the drug, um, leading to varying rates of hydrolysis. So the more stuff you have on that ester, uh, the more difficult it is for an ester to esterase to cleave off um, that potaflotoxin. So this is important because it would allow us to control the rate at which potaflotoxin is released in a biological system and allow for more specific treatment. So here we have designed and synthesized six variations or six, um, six esters of potaflotoxin, um, acetate, propanoate, isobutyrate, phthaloate, hexanoate, um, and phenylacetate. And these differing esters are highlighted in red. And you may wonder why we focused on esterases specifically. Um, while they're involved in major metabolic uh, metabolic pathways and present across, across um, all cell types, so they are relatively easy to bioassay for, um, and they're pretty useful. So we initially performed esterase assays on these compounds by injecting solutions um, of each ester with a certain esterase, lipase, lysozyme, or acylase. And then we would put them in the LCMS to see whether or not we can see the potaflotoxin separate from um, the initial compound. And this is um, like the same method, or just like think about it the same way that we did with the photoreleasing drugs. You can, if you see the potaflotoxin peak, that signifies that um, the esterase was successful in cleaving the potaflotoxin from the ester. Um, we actually found that for the esterases that were tested for, there was no cleavage um, from the ester to the potaflotoxin. So we have moved on, moved on to biological assays of the C4 esters. Um, we basically are running MTT assays right now. Um, we have um, the results on the right side here. There seems to be no general trend um, in the toxicity of the effects of the drug um, based on concentration, um, but the drugs do seem to be effective in um, lowering the cell viability. Here are some other C4 analogs that we have worked on, um, deoxygenated poto, oxidized poto, and alkene poto. Oxidized poto is especially important since we can derive a lot of our other analogs from this compound. And we're also working on the synthesis of a poto ADC. So ADCs are very effective in cancer treatments um, due to their ability to offer selective drug delivery, since you can target a specific antigen on a cancer cell and um, get the drug directly delivered to that um, tumor. And what makes this ADC more interesting is that you have a photoreleasable linker over here. And this will not only really um, allow for the selective targeting of cancer cells, but it will also allow for the controlled release of potaflotoxin into these cells, since you will be controlling um, when these linkers connecting the ADC um, or the antibody to the potaflotoxin is cleaved. And for future work, we plan to explore new analogs as well um, as explore a little bit more into molecular docking. Um, this is all to evaluate the toxicity and um, relative to just regular potaflotoxin. And we're also working to conjugate poto onto multiple peptides um, such as G11 and um, RGD to encourage more specific drug delivery. And lastly, I would like to thank um, Edward for guiding our project, as well as all the other group members that were involved um, in our POTO project. Thank you for listening. Hey, great job, Alyssa. Questions? Questions for Alyssa? I have a question. Um, can you simulate the sound of the wild mandrake from Harry Potter? No, because I didn't even know that existed before it, like you told me about that. So no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was, I didn't know it existed until we Googled it. And, and I was like, wow, there's the cartoon of Codifil Toxin. Mm -hmm. Questions, questions, questions. Okay. 
So it's getting late. Um, and uh, I think thank you all for your and your long standing attention. Uh, but thank you all at a later cloak and have a good evening, folks. <laughs>